Could it find it? Or it? So I heard the same. We asked on um, all of our ones that we wonder if that would have been this whole yeah. 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 Welcome back, everyone, to this last of our plan plenary talks. I know, very sad. Please try to contain your tears until after the talk. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Ina Zakharevich from Cornell, who will tell us how to detect non permutative elements of the first K theory of varieties using point counting. Thanks, Ina. Um, since I am the last talk at both sites i wanted to thank the organizers for the really amazing job they did at both sites so let's want to say and so i'm i'm talking about detecting non-permutative elements of k1 of varieties using point counting but i think most people don't know what either k1 of varieties is or what non-permutative means um, and so I'm going to start by explaining what the title of my talk is, and that will take a little while, and then we'll get to the point counting portion of the talk. So the K theory variety starts with K zero of varieties. So there's some base field K. You can do this over a base scheme if you want, but I'm not going to worry about that at all. Just have a base field. So this is defined to be the free abelian group generated by varieties over K. And we're gonna have two relations, well, really one relation. Um, so if you have a closed uh, immersion from Y into X, then we're gonna say that X is equal to Y plus the complement. And from this relation, you can actually get the other relation that people sometimes want me to mention, which is that if two varieties are isomorphic, then they're equal in this group. Um, so it is, um, but this actually follows from this one relation, or rather this uncountably many probably relations, um, uh, possibly countably many, depending on how you do it. Um, and so it doesn't matter, you can, there are no set theoretic issues here. And I said I called it a ring, but I defined it to be a group, so I also want to define the multiplication. And the multiplication is simply represented by Cartesian product. So there it is. This is the growth indique ring of varieties. It uh, is a place where additive invariance of varieties live. So one of the classic things is point counting. If you count points and you break up a variety along this kind of a relation, then every point is either in the subvariety or in the complement. So the number of points in the variety is going to be the number of points in this subvariety plus the number of points in the complement. There's other things you can do involving, uh, if you're over C, mixed Hodge structures. If you're over a finite field, you can do compactly supported elatic cohomology or something like that. And then you do the usual uh, alternating sum of cohomology classes, and that will give you another additive invariant. And this is sort of the, the home for all of them. If you have any kind of invariant that satisfies this relation, it will, the invariant will factor through this object. So this is, this is a very interesting ring that appears in many places. Um, I'm not gonna be going far more into the history of it, except I wanna point out it's a K0, and it does kind of look like a K0 in that you have a freely generated thing and you're quotienting out by sort of a cutting relation. And I really want to give the analogy to K0 of a ring, where this is the free abelian group generated by a finitely generated projective 
R modules. And we're going to quotient out by the relation that whenever you have an exact sequence, uh, we're going to say that B is A plus C. And again, from this one relation, it follows that if two R modules are isomorphic, then they are equal in this ring, in this group, I guess. I haven't given you the product structure, but you can probably imagine what it would be. Um, and so the, the definitions are quite similar, except that somehow we have a notion of exact sequence uh, for the K theory of a ring, but we don't for this K theory of varieties. And what this means is that the usual definitions of K-theory that involve something like an exact category or an abelian category, a Waldhausen category, or something else. And if you haven't seen these, please don't worry about it. It won't matter at all for what I'm about to say next, um, that it doesn't have these tools. But the thing that happens is that it doesn't matter. So it turns out, I'm just going to give this as a fact, even though this is like three different theorems. Um, I suppose I should say Jonathan Campbell and me and the two of us together for the three theorems that I'm going to be saying right now, but um, the, the fact is that there exists a spectrum called K of varieties with K zero of varieties being the zeroth homotopy group of this spectrum. And the uh, higher groups have meaning. And I'm being very vague when I say have meaning, what does this mean? But uh, I just mean that, okay, for any abelian group, you can, or any commutative ring, you can take the eilenberg maclean spectrum, and that will give you a spectrum, but the higher homotopy groups are not particularly meaningful and won't tell you anything more about what's going on in the story you're trying to tell. So if I wanted to define higher algebraic K groups, I could just take the growth in the eilenberg maclean spectrum of this group, and it wouldn't give us any further information um, in a way that a, a good construction of K theory produces higher K groups in using the same formula as this with actually interesting relevant information about how the ring works. Um, so all I'm saying here when the higher say the higher groups have meaning is that this is constructed in a way that you would expect the higher K groups to actually produce meaningful invariance of what's going on for varieties in an analogous way to the way that K zero over of a ring can be lifted to a higher K theory. And in this case, so K1 of varieties is just defined to be pi one of this spectrum. But how do we think about K1 of varieties? What should it mean? And again, I'm going to go to this analogy with a ring and tell you a little bit about K1 of a ring or really K1 of a field. I'm not gonna be telling you that much about K1 of a ring. And I'm going to try to understand what K1 of varieties means in that case. So K1 of a field can be defined to be F cross. But the way that we usually define, and the way that we usually define K1 of a ring, this is going to be true for all rings, just not always a definition. This is GL of R abelianized. So you can see why for F it'll produce F cross. But the way that I want to think about K1 of a ring is this is the place where determinants live. I will mention that sometimes the determinant of a matrix with entries in a commutative ring is defined using the formula summing over all permutations of multiplications in the matrix. And then it won't live here, it'll live in a quotient of this. Um, or rather in a sum and. Um, but I want to argue that's not really the correct intuition about what determinants should be. This is where the determinant of a matrix should live. Um, and the nice thing about determinants is that they are 
uh, easier to compute and they're easier to work with because of this abelianization. And so it's sort of a reasonable thing to say. So here's another way that you can describe determinants. So we know that for every n, we have a map determinant from n, which goes from gln of r to something, which is going to be k1, but I'm just going to give it a group like this. And this is additive in the, sen in the following sense. If we take gl of n, I'm going to drop the r to space space, cross GL of M, we have a block diagonal sum which goes into GL of N plus M. And we can map down to A cross A and down to A. And then here we have the operation in the group. Here we have the block sum. And here we have determinant cross determinant. And here we have determinant and this commutes. So it's not additive in the sense that you add matrices, but it is additive in the sense that you can add dimensions. And we also have two computations that we use. The first is that the determinant of 0, 1, 1, 0 is negative 1. And the other one is that the, we have an injection from GL1 into A. So these are sort of the two things that we usually use in order to compute determinants. If you just have a one by one entry, it is just that entry. Um, if you swap two rows, you multiply the determinant by negative one, and you have this notion. So the question of what this negative one means uh, can get a little bit complicated, but the other three can are are far more general and you can sort of see how you can build up a theory of determinants just using these properties. And the nice thing about the K theory of, of K1 of varieties is that you have a similar kind of set of properties. So uh, in varieties, we have a similar kind of property. I'm gonna call these determinants. Uh, so for every variety X, we have a determinants of X, which goes from the automorphism group of X to K1 of varieties, which by the way, is an, I assumed A was an abelian group. K1 of varieties is an abelian group because it's pi one of a spectrum. So, so far we're still good. Um, we have, it is additive in the following sense, that if you take the automorphism group of X and the automorphism group of Y, we can take a block diagonal sum to the automorphism group of X disjoint union Y. Um, and then we can do determinants. And this is gonna go to K1 cross K1. And this is going to go to K1, and this is the addition, and this commutes. And so now the question becomes, what should our computations be? We wanted, we also want this kind of nice determinant from something that we can understand well to A. And at this one, because varieties are a bit more complicated than matrices, I'm going to give a slightly weaker form of this. We have a notion of determinant from the multiplicative group of your base field to K1 of varieties over that base field. And what this does is it takes an element to uh, the affine line and the uh, multiplication by that element. And this lives in the automorphism group of the affine line, which is much, much bigger than just this. But it is at least a nice one dimensional thing. And then this is going to go to K1 of varieties using this map here. Oh, I'm not of, I put it in the subscript. So, one might ask, is this injective? And I don't know, but I conjecture that it is. So conjecture 
this map over here is injective. And I think it should be, but I don't actually know how to prove it. So if anybody is interested, I'm happy to discuss. Um, so this is sort of the first kind of notion of this um, computation. And the next question is, what should this swap be? And there's a nice uh, explicit idea of this swap as well. There's a functor from the category of finite sets into the category of varieties, which just sends a finite set to that many copies of the point. And any kind of permutation of the finite set will permute these copies of the point. So it's a reasonable functor. It's compatible with the K-theoretic structures that you need in order to describe the K-theory. And so this leads to a map from the K-theory of finite sets to the K-theory of varieties. And on this, you know, this is the sphere spectrum. So we know what pi 1 is. Pi 1 is Z mon 2, and it maps into there. And the thing that I said about swapping two things, this is the thing that makes sense. When you have two things that swap, uh, you have two copies of point and swap it, that's what this negative 1 should be. Um, and so you could, for instance, ask, does it agree with the negative one from here? And I don't know. I think it's a great question. Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no, and I don't know exactly how to put it on it. Um, so that's another question you can ask. But in, uh, if your base field is finite, which is going to be the case that we're really going to be focusing on in this talk, we also have a map from varieties back to finite sets, so, which sorry, takes a variety. Can I just mm -hmm. clarify? So you said there is the minus one and this element eta. You said there you don't know if they're the same, or you say that you know that, that sometimes I, they're not the same. We know that so I know that sometimes in many cases they are not the same. Oh, I see. Um, I think I but there are other cases where I haven't been able to distinguish them. So I'm curious to see whether they're just always different or whether they are sometimes the same. I have no idea. Um, yeah, there are definitely cases we're going to see one where you can distinguish them. Um, okay, so in this here, x maps to the k points of x, which is a finite set because k is finite. And again, any kind of automorphism of the variety will induce a permutation on the k points. And so this gives a good map of k theories. And so we have a map back. And so this means that in this situation, we have that the k theory of varieties splits as a copy of the sphere spectrum and then something maybe we want to call the reduced k theory of varieties. And this determinant of this swap lives in here. So quite often it's going to be different from the negative one in the in the multiplication of the field because in the place that sometimes you can detect that k one is going to live that the negative one for multiplication in the field is going to live in this reduced one and so you know it's different. But when the base field is not finite you don't have this splitting and so we can't just use a sort of trivial observation in order to determine that they're always going to be different. Um, okay, so this is sort of the place where we start with that. Um, but so you, this sort of, if you're thinking of a theory of determinants of things like that, you can think of K1 as where a determinant of an automorphism of varieties ought to live. Um, but it's actually K1, maybe it's not a lot bigger than that, but it's at least has building blocks that are far larger than it. Because you can check that every element of K1 is, can be represented by a piecewise automorphism of a variety. So you take a variety, you decompose it into pieces using this relation up there with, with cutting out a closed subvariety, and then you put all the pieces back in such a way that you get the same variety back. Um, and that doesn't necessarily come from an automorphism. That could be a much more general type of thing. Um, 
So K1 might be bigger, but it might be the case that every element in K1 can actually be represented by a variety and an automorphism. Um, although actually, no, it can't. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that because I think it's cool. So sort of a priori, given everything that I've said, um, it is not at all obvious whether all elements of K1 can be represented by automorphism. So I'm going to tell you a fact. There exist elements in K1 of varieties which are not represented by automorphisms. And so in this sense, this picture of determinants isn't a full picture. There's more interesting stuff going on. And the reason for this is the following. So um, and if you're interested in seeing why this is the case, um, this is in my K theory of assemblers paper. Um, so if there is an element, well, actually, so. If all elements of K1 are representable by automorphisms, then there do not exist varieties x and y such that x equals y in the k in the growth and decreeing of variety so somehow these are equal up to these kinds of cutting and pasting but x and y are not piecewise isomorphic. So how can this happen? It looks at first glance like what we're doing is we're just imposing the relation that like, oh, if you cut something up into pieces, it's equal to the sum of the pieces. So it should be the case that two things are equal in the growth and decreeing exactly when they're piecewise isomorphic. And if you've ever done any kind of classical scissors congruence, this is what happens with classical scissors congruence groups. Two things are equal in the scissors congruence group exactly when they're, uh, they're scissors congruent. But here's something that could happen. Suppose that y is much lower dimension than x. And suppose there's another y prime, much lower dimension than x, that you can embed into x in such a way that the complements are isomorphic then y equals x minus the complement and y prime equals x minus the complement. So now y and y prime have to be equal, but we didn't say anything at all about how they break up into pieces. So it is entirely possible that the higher dimensional varieties impose relations between the lower dimensional varieties in some way which uh, does something interesting. And at least when k has characteristic zero, these are known to exist. No. Oh, yeah, sorry. The question is, can I have a, give a good example? Um, so there's a paper, this, this result is originally due to Borisov, but there's a bunch of examples constructed by others. And it's you, they're usually over C, and some people have done work over other like subfields of C and things like that where you take things that are mirror symmetric in some way and then you multiply them by the affine line a bunch of times and then at a certain point they suddenly become equal and something something mumble mumble like cool algebraic geometry that I don't fully understand. Borisov's paper is called the class of the affine line is a zero divisor and it's only about six pages long and it constructs an almost example in the sense that it gives you a list of six examples and we don't know which of them actually works, but one of them works. Um, and this is what, what his proof concludes. Um, it's great. And then there's a whole series of papers that many, many people have written with other examples constructed, often in similar ways where there's sort of a list of three or four examples and it's not clear exactly which of them works, but one of them works. The point being that you sort of, we know that at the beginning they're not the same 
and then at, in the growth and decreeing. And then when you multiply up by the affine line enough times, they do become the same, but it's unclear at which intermediate point it actually becomes the same. Um, so this is, these are quite fun to look at, um, but I definitely with no preparation will not give any more specific answers. Um, so, right, so, but these are known to exist at least over C. I don't think there are any known examples over fields of finite characteristic. Please correct me if I'm wrong. So this is still open over finite characteristics, um, but over characteristic zero, it's known. So over finite characteristic, it might be true that every element is representable by an automorphism, but we don't know. So there's sort of, there's a lot in this K1 of varieties story, and this is just a small part of it, but this is a small part that I wanna focus on, but it's something where we can actually do some computations and actually conclude something concrete without having to delve deep into the really scary complications. Okay, so here's the sort of more specific question I want to ask. Just computing these automorphisms and K1 is hard because there's so much going on and automorphism group of varieties are very complicated even for simple varieties. But one of the ways of working with complicated things like the growth and decreeing of varieties is by mapping out of it and seeing how, wh where you can land. And one of the classic ways of doing this is point counting. If you want to distinguish two classes in the growth and decreeing of varieties, there you can do point counting, and that gives you a map to Z. And if they have different numbers of points, then they're different. Um, and because, as I said up there, the point mapping to the K points gives you a well-defined map on K theories, suddenly this measure gives you not just a map out of variety k0 varieties it gives you a map out of all k theory of varieties into the homotopy into the stable homotopy groups of spheres so there's certain things that you can do that just so just a very basic example let's suppose that we're working over f7 and I'm gonna, I need a variety and an automorphism so I'm going to look at a1 and my automorphism is going to be multiplication by negative one. Um, so what we have after we apply the, the take the k points functor is that we get, um, so I'll do, I'll write this a1 negative one, and what this maps to under point counting is the set of seven points plus or minus three, plus or minus two, plus or minus one, zero, and flip sign. And most stable homotopy groups of spheres don't have a nice description in terms of permutations, but pi one does. If you give a permutation, then it maps to the sign of the permutation in Z mod two. And this is three flips. So this maps to negative one inside pi one of s. So we can tell that this element in k1 of varieties, um, we can tell that this element is non-zero using point counting. But I want to point out, for instance, if I take an f5, we wouldn't have been able to conclude that this element is non-zero because it would map, we wouldn't have this negative three, and so we'd only have two flips and so what we would get is that it's zero in pi one. Well, one, I suppose, since I'm writing multiplicatively. And so we wouldn't know. I mean, it could still be non-zero or it could be zero. We don't know. And this, this is a really sort of basic elementary kind of computation. And in particular, it doesn't really let us do uh, detect interesting parts of the ring structure on the K theory of varieties. I told you the ring structure on K0, and then I told you that all of this 
stuff lifts to a spectrum. And that spectrum is, in fact, an Ian affinity ring spectrum induced by this multiplication of varieties. And so there's some interesting ring structure as well. And in particular, I'm not going to write it down here. I'm going to um, write it at the top of this. Um, I just blanked on what I was about to write. <laughs> okay, so we have this, we want to do this. Right, okay. So we have this interesting ring map. We have a map from K0 varieties tensored with the entire stable homotopy groups of spheres. Um, and then we can use the map where we take the variety, which is just a finite number of points. We can map this to K0 tensored with all the K groups of varieties. And then we can map under multiplication, and we'll just call it mu, that this goes to the K theory groups of varieties. And this is actually an interesting thing to do. Yes. Uh, it's just whatever you want this. Oh, sorry, the question is what's the field and here this will work for any field. Because you can take a variety with finitely many points over any field. And what happens if we first just take a variety, uh, an element just represented by a single variety and then we take something it's you know it's gonna there's gonna be something involving permutations I don't know what it is. And then what this does is it just plugs X into all the places in this picture that had points in various ways. So maybe there was two points somewhere and then five points, some kind of weird diagram inside of the category of finite sets, um, which is representing an element in, in pi star. And then under multiplication, this will give you something. But this is, oh, sorry, no, this is, this is the whole map. Um, this lives in here. Um, so all it's really doing is if you're thinking about in K1, where it's just the only place where we can do it nicely, is you have some permutation on a set of, of points, and you replace every point with a copy of your chosen variety, and now you're permuting whole varieties. But you're not using any of the higher interesting geometric structure inside those varieties. You're just using the fact that, hey, there is a variety. And this is not... It's, this is not necessarily a trivial thing. You can use this to show the following. So K4S minus one of uh, varieties is non-zero for S bigger than zero. And this is an image of the J-homomorphism thing. You pick your variety with a nice enough Euler characteristic and then you can do, oh, sorry, uh, and here we want K to be a subfield of C. Um, so you can check that there are infinitely many non-zero homotopy groups, but this is just an image of J trick. So which are sort of, which again is stuff that's present in here. It's not stuff which is using the fact that varieties are far more interesting than points. So what we want to do, what I want to do here is I'm going to say that the image of this map is the permutative elements. And the question becomes, do there exist non-permutative elements? Is all of the interesting higher structure coming just from the interesting higher structure in spheres or can we find more interesting things that are going on because varieties are interesting? And I mean, hopefully unsurprisingly, the answer is yes, there exists plenty of non-permutative elements, but I want to give a description of how you find them. And at first I'm just gonna give you a, the 
main computational result, and then I'll spend the rest of the talk talking about how this main computational result comes around. So theorem. So let's suppose that K is FQ, which we need for point counting, and that uh, Q is two to the L times some odd number. Um, oh, Q minus one. Not Q, obviously. Um, so uh, Q minus one is two to the L times some odd number in particular, because it's odd characteristic. This ought to work an even characteristic, but I have not worked it out. Um, so then the element P1 or A1, it doesn't matter, they're gonna be equal. And then multiplication by alpha, where alpha is a two to the Lth root of unity. Yes. Oh, sorry, the question is, is it a primitive? It is a primitive two to the Lth root of unity. Uh, then this element is non-permutative. And so the rest of the talk is going to be talking about how you set this up so that you can actually uh, show this. Because the question of how you determined, how you distinguish permutative and non-permutative elements is sort of a difficult thing because you need to make sure that whatever map you're using, if you're using a uh, motivic measure to like a higher motivic measure in order to analyze elements of the K theory varieties, you need it to be something that preserves the ring structure. So you need not just to construct a map that preserves K theory structure, but one which is compatible with multiplication. And this is actually surprisingly difficult in particular. So in the paper where we prove this theorem, we show that um, multiplication by negative one is non-trivial and is not in this Z mod two component and is uh, for uh, fields of characteristic three mod four, um, which you can sort of see as, as a beginning of this type of thing? Yes? I don't want to ask a yes. question. I want to make sure I understand what you mean. When you say multiplication by alpha, you're taking a point in P1 that has two homogeneous coordinates, and you're multiplying one of them by alpha. Correct. In fact, maybe I'm going to replace this with A1, because these elements are actually going to be equal. So it doesn't matter. And now it's less uh, confusing what I mean by multiple. Sorry, the question was, when I say P1, do I mean that I take the two homogeneous coordinates and I multiply one of them by alpha? And the answer is yes, I pick say the first coordinate and I multiply it by alpha. But actually the element with P1 is equal to the element with A1. And so I can just uh, replace this with A1 and then hopefully it's less confusing. Um, so yeah, so, uh, right. So you can do this kind of thing but the map that we construct in order to do this, this analysis um, in this paper doesn't respect the ring structure. And the, the reason for this is that if you're trying to use cohomological type measures in a way that creates maps out of the growth and ring, you need to take cohomology with compact supports. Otherwise, it's not additive. If you are just breaking something up into an open and a closed, you need cohomology with compact supports because cohomology won't give you the correct invariant. And you can see this actually in classical topology too, just in terms of seeing that the ordinary Euler characteristic is not additive if you're not using compact supports. And so we need to use compact supports. And now it becomes very difficult to define cohomology in a way which is functorial enough to respect K-theoretic structure because famously the derived category is not good enough to determine the K theory. And so you're not, you can't map on the derived category. You need an honest functor out of an honest category. And so because choices aren't functorial, we end up having to make all the choices, take the category of all uh, varieties with a chosen compactification, and then after that, you have no more choices to make, but that breaks the multiplicative structure. And so it's sort of, it's more difficult and you need to use different uh, machinery than we used in this paper to make sure that the map is actually multiplicative. So that's sort of the technical uh, digression. If you didn't care, don't worry, I'm not gonna be talking about it anymore. 
I want to talk about what I'm doing here that does respect the, the multiplicative structure. So how do we do this? Well, first, I'm going to need to give a definition. So before I said that point counting is a map from a variety to the set category of finite sets. But a variety over a finite field doesn't just know its k points. It also knows all of the points over all finite extensions of the field. Now, if you take the k bar points, that's no longer a finite set. But it is what is called known as an almost finite set. Um, actually, we've already at this conference had this paper of Dress and Ziebeneicher mentioned where they talk about the almost finite sets for a profinite field. This is also from that paper. This is the same definition of an almost finite set. I'm just restricting the profinite group to be z hat. So an almost finite set is a set S with a z hat action. So this z hat is the profinite completion of z, um, such that for all open subgroups H, S to the H is finite. So you look at NZ hat and you look at the fixed points and that's gonna be finite. And that's saying how many points are in this variety over an extension of degree N, which is finite because that's still a finite field. And in addition, the, the Z hat orbit of any point is finite. And so what that says is, well, any point in, in, over k bar is contained inside some finite extension. And so any point has a finite orbit. So this is what I mean by almost finite. It's not finite, it's very infinite. But if you restrict a sort of a finite set of extensions, then this becomes finite and it's sort of infinite in a controlled way. I guess you spelled out the definition completely, but I'm having a hard time understanding what is an almost finite set. Can you say it in other words or like um, give an example? An example, I mean, the example that we want is the k-bar points of, uh, of a variety over a finite field. So I'll write that down. So the important example is x of k bar is almost finite. If k is finite. Okay, and the thing is, if we took allowed infinite sets and we tried to take k theory of that, we would get something boring because I own Briggs Windle. But if we take almost finite sets, it's controlled the infiniteness, and so you don't have an Island Briggs Windle anymore. And so the k theory of almost finite sets is not trivial. And in particular, there's a map from the k-theory of almost finite sets to the product of n bigger than or equal to 1 of the pointed suspension spectrum of B z mod n. And this is, uh, and the conjecture is, this is a weak equivalence. Um, Traditionally, for things like Waldhausen categories with a cylinder function and exact categories, it is known that the K theory, uh, that K theory commutes with infinite products. And you can show that this K theory can be obtained as an infinite product of categories where each of them has this as the K theory. And this map actually turns up into an infinite product of those maps. So if we knew that K theory for these kinds of categories commuted with infinite products, we would know this is a weak equivalence. However, it turns out that all of the known proofs don't work for this K theory. And so this is at this point just a conjecture, not a known fact. But regardless, that's fine. We don't have to think of our point counting as living in here. We can just push it over to here and be in here. And here we know at least pi zero and pi one very well. Pi zero is Z. 
and pi one is z mod two plus z mod n. Higher homotopic groups, it's more complicated and I don't know, and you need to talk to more impressive stable homotopy than people than me to talk about the higher homotopy groups of this, but I know pi zero and pi one. Yeah, this is inside the product. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, the, the, yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, so the, the question was, what does this N mean if it's not inside the product? And I said, the N is inside the product. And uh, that was what it means. So this is, this is the classifying space of Z mod N. Um, um, so for those of you who haven't seen stable homotopy groups of classifying spaces, they're really interesting and strange and there's a bunch of cool math there. But the, uh, the upshot of the whole thing is, I don't know what the higher homotopy groups are. But I don't need to because I only care about pi zero and pi one for the purposes of what we're doing today. Okay, so the important observation is that if an element in K1 of varieties is permutative, then its image in Z mod 2 cross Z plus Z mod N is contained inside Z mod 2 plus the trivial group. You cannot get any interesting elements inside the Z mod N from a permutative element. I'm out of time right now, right? So I should, I'm gonna say two more sentences and then I will stop. So, um, so this is, so the key point is finding an interesting element in here. And I'm gonna very quickly draw a picture of how such an interesting element can show up. If you look over an extension at a, at a point that's sitting over an extension, it comes with a, say, quadratic extension. So let's say it comes with a Galois conjugate. Um, and if you look at an automorphism, it can move this point sort of horizontally and move this, uh, this uh, and, and sort of not play around with this Galois element at all. Actually, I have a pink here, so I'm gonna draw this in pink to make it clear which one is the automorphism and which one is the Galois conjugate. But sometimes what you get is you get a Galois pair that your automorphism interferes with. And these interesting elements in Z mod N come from this interference of the automorphism acting and the Galois group acting. Um, and what you need to do is you need to figure out the combinatorics of how these things work. And the point is that in order to get the map out of the K theory varieties, you map to the K theory of almost finite sets and then do a bunch of combinatory uh, uh, analysis to find such orbits and count them to determine that you get non-trivial coordinates in here. And that was what I wanted to say. Questions from the local audience? 